Okay, just for the sake of the recording, let's back up. Um, so we went through all of this stuff last week. That's all in the last video. So principal flow analysis, the idea is go from three from some large dimensional space to a small subspace, right? Which contains those points much more densely packed. And so if you imagine these images of faces as points in that space, the space is actually very sparsely sampled. Like those faces would really lie in a very small subspace within this 3072 dimensional space. So principal component analysis would allow us to go from pixel space to a smaller space of principal components as they're called. Those are the, those are the, the, um, the basis vectors for the space. Like basically the, the uh, you know, like, like your X, Y, Z plane, you know, this would be the new, the new coordinate space, right? And it's invertible. You can go forwards. It's just multi like a matrix multiplication. It's linear. And then you can go backwards. You can go back from this to this. But of course, like you've corrupted the space if you remove, you know, some of the components. And then you will have images that aren't quite, you know, what they used to be. Now, um, so for, and then this kind of just shows it, like suppose you were to, um, you know, suppose you were to take all those images, get your principal components, and then and then keep 2,000 components, let's say. If you kept 2,000, then to go back from uh, the PCA codes to the back to pixel space, you would have mostly a correct reconstruction. That's if you keep 2,000 components, that's a lot. If you have 1,000, it's mostly correct, but there's artifacts. This is 500 components. You see it's starting to, starting to degrade, right? This is now just 100 components. And it's still impressive because like, you know, this kind of looks still like the original image a little bit, but it's, it's saved with just 100 points. So this is a 3,072 dimensional number, a 3,072 number um, code that um, we reduce to just 100 numbers. And then from those 100 numbers, we can still get this image. So it's, so it's actually quite a compression. Um, it's not as good as JPEG compression, but it's pretty good. Um, 50, now it's starting to degrade more and more. This is now 10, 2, and 1. So this is, we have just one number um, representing the number. Now the reason why, uh, representing the face. Now the reason why it still looks like there's some appreciable amount of information is that with one number, it basically just says we have a face, right? And so it's the average face in the data set, right? And the data set is, of course, biased. I mean, every data set is biased. No such thing as unbiased data set. This reflects the bias of this particular data set. Um, so I thought everyone would like that. Yeah. Actually, and then this, this really even better um, kind of illustrates that because now picking different numbers, you can see that all roads lead to George W. Bush. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so now, now the nice thing about this is that now, with the let's say you take two faces in this, you know, and then you reduce them. Uh, sorry, you take two points in the PCA space, and then you draw a line between them, and then at each point along that line, you decode back into the original pixel space. Well, that lets you do these interpolations, right? Here's a face going from you know from here to here and you could see that in some cases like it even the face rotates slowly um, or you know or like a, a hat turns into hair and you can see things like that uh, kind of creeping up and then this is this is uh, yeah this is kind of the idea these are all random codes uh, decode ra random numbers inside of the PCA space decoded into the into original images and so these are fake faces right now they're not particularly good um, you know they, they look kind of blurry right and th that makes a lot of sense like it's just not a very good generative model because PCA is not really designed to be a generative model um, be and it's not a very good one because it's very rigid PCA is, is a linear model so it has to so the space is always modeled in flat you know in terms of flat hyperplanes basically and so it's very very um, stiff doesn't really capture the complexity of the data set um, yeah these are interpolations 
So um, now I think, if I'm not mistaken, I we can go back to the slides now. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, PCA, you know, is a you you can look at you can look up the math. We didn't really cover it in much detail, but you'll see that the math is all like standard linear algebra. It's all just like multiplications and additions, and um, it does a pretty good job. But something that would do an even better job is a neural network, mm -hmm. of course. Um, and the first one that we can kind of look at is an autoencoder. An autoencoder is a neural network that can be defined um, as such. It's a neural network that has two properties kind of that are important. One is that the objective of this neural network is to reconstruct the input as the output. So in other words, like this neural network takes in an image as its input, and then it will go through the, you know, through the through the layers, forward pass through the layers, and then at the end, the output layer is the same as the input layer. It has the same number of, of units. And the objective is to train the neural network to have the exact same numbers from the input as they are in the output, right? Um, a joke I make about this sometimes is that it's the world's like most expensive way of, of doing times one, right? Um, it's just a, like a really, yeah, basically it's times one. That's the goal, right? Um, and now that may seem kind of silly, like what's the utility of, of a neural network that produces the same thing that you already have, right? Well, um, the, uh, the thing is that the, the second property is what makes it so interesting. The, the second property is that at some point in the neural network, there's a middle layer somewhere in the middle that has a, that's kind of a bottleneck. It's a very small number of neurons, right? Now, this is a forward pass goes from left to right, right? Which means that at the point that it gets to here, you've compressed this image to be represented by just, in this case, three numbers. Just three numbers are representing, you know, ha have been con this image has been condensed into three numbers. And so, therefore, to go from these three numbers back to the original image is, is uh, really impressive, in a sense, because... It's not, uh, you know, how much information can you really contain inside of three numbers? Well, a lot, it turns out, that if these, um, if these decoders, you know, these decoding connections are good enough at, at figuring out, you know, how to go from these three numbers to an original image, right? And this we sometimes call the latent space, right? Because the latent space in this case is like a three-dimensional space, which contains every combination of these three numbers um, or these three units here, and um, and and so every image is kind of like a point in that space. Um, now an autoencoder is kind of like PCA, really. Like PCA, you can think of this way as well. Um, you can even draw it in a diagram this way. You know, you have the the principal component. Uh, the first step of the principal component analysis is to go from here to here. We're going from the original pixel space to some number of principal components. And then the reverse is to go from the principal components back to the um, original pixel space. But the difference between this and PCA is that the, uh, these neurons have nonlinearities added to them, right? They have some sigmoid or ReLU or whatever, those, those uh, nonlinearities that you get with neural networks, right? Um, and so it does a better job because, uh, than PCA because it's able to model data sets in, with much more complexity. They can model curves and, you know, sort of much more irregular, irregularly shaped, you know, data sets, which is basically any data set that you find in real life. Um, now, um, this is like a, a sort of vanilla autoencoder that there's, a, that's, that's, that's it. Um, there are um, there are modifications that turn out to be useful. The thing that you'll most commonly encounter if you ever use an autoencoder is what's called a variational autoencoder. And a variational autoencoder just has one extra thing, which is that it imposes um, a particular structure on this late on this like latent space layer, which is that um, it wants the all of the points to be distributed. Like a nor like a normal distribution, like nice and evenly spaced, basically. And we will we'll maybe get into the specifics of that later, but but for now I'll just kind of leave it at that. 
Um, the reason why that's useful is because then you don't have big empty spaces in your latent space, um, which will produce nonsense junk if you move through them. Um, but there's a cost to that, but, but it's okay. Like we'll, we'll kind of get to that. Yeah, another way of thinking of autoencoders, like, you know, it's a neural network that has two parts, really. You can almost think of them as two neural networks. Um, really, it's one, but, you know, with two halves. One is an encoder half, which turns the image into a, into this, you know, set of numbers, and then one is a decoder, right? So you could just grab the decoder and put in random numbers and then run them through the decoder, and you'll get something that looks like a face. And that's what we did with PCA as well. Um, oh, by the way, um, I, I guess I didn't mention this, but for anyone who wants to play with the PCA demo, you can actually uh, do that if you go to the guides here. Um, and then I have PCA, or do I? Where is it? Um, it's oh, it's like, oh, yeah, it's the eigenfaces demo. Yeah. Eigenfaces are, is like basically principal component analysis on faces. The reason why it's called eigenfaces is that principal component analysis is, is almost the same thing as as what's called eigenvector decomposition. From anyone who's ever taken the linear algebra course, that should be pretty familiar. Okay. Um, so uh, what are autoencoders useful for? Um, besides for generative models, they, they have almost no real applications as far as anyone knows. One useful thing that they can do is denoising data. So like you train an autoencoder on uh, noisy data and the autoencoder uh, will, you know, you forward that image through the autoencoder and then, and then you get, um, and then you, you will uh, remove the noise, you know, whether it's speckles or, you know, whether, you know, some kind of a artifact from, from a bad camera or something like that. So that's one kind of nice thing that they can do. Um, but other than that, they're, they're kind of uh, a curiosity and also that they can be used as a generative model to generate things, like generate fake things. Um, now they've been mostly supplanted by generative adversarial networks, which seem to be better for that. Um, but you know, maybe may, a lot of people disagree. Um, there's a lot of like really interesting kind of debate about this, this issue. Maybe autoencoders will go back in vogue and so they're kind of worth um, you know, worth sort of being um, in touch with. Um, this is a MNIST VA, VAE stands for variation autoencoder. That's an autoencoder that um, just just don't worry about the distinction for now. It's basically an autoencoder. <laughs> um, like variational just means it has this whole like normal distribution is Gaussian latent space, it's nice and smooth. And, um, and so this is a one that's been trained on handwritten digits. So this is what the, what it looks like if you take all of the original images and run them through the network to be reconstructed, um, and you can see that like it'll there's some weirdnesses like this looks kind of like a five maybe, but it's actually a three. I think someone who writes their fives like threes or threes like fives. Um, you can see that the images are pretty decent reconstructions, although it seems like they're kind of blurry. So that's kind of a a thing that you'll notice a lot with autoencoders is that they're they're sort of blurry, they produce blurry um, images, and that and that makes a lot of sense because the the objective is to reconstruct the input, and so like what if you know um, the the problem with that is that um, what if the output is the same as the input except shifted by one pixel, you know one pixel to the right or one pixel down then um, then the loss function would tell you that you have a very bad fit, even though it's the exact same image shifted by one pixel, right? So it's not actually a very good way of measuring, um, you know, why, uh, like, it's not a very good way of measuring just how good the reconstruction is. And so this is kind of why it ends up being blurry is that the the, the network is trying to kind of like, you know, hedge its bets. Like maybe the zero will be roughly over here, maybe it'll be over here. And so that's why it's kind of blurry. And, th and then, you know, that's why reconstruction loss is actually not a very good way of evaluating them. And, you know, maybe that's like one of the problems. Um, now, a much, well, I, I don't want to say better because it's controversial, but let's say one way um, that at least produces images that look, that appear to be better is something called a generative adversarial network. And this is like the sort of um, GANs. This is, this is what 
gets all of the press at least. Um, and Gans are Gans are really interesting. They're kind of um, a curiosity, and they've been really successful at generating realistic looking images. Um, they were introduced by Ian Goodfellow in 2014. So this is an algorithm that's just five years old, um, and which so that's that's uh, yeah. It, that means that a kindergartner is older than than uh, Gans. So they're really, really new, um, and they're, uh, well, uh, it's also controversial because some people think that, you know, there's a lot of um, debate in the machine learning community whether or not they're inspired by some earlier things, and, you know, it's, it's kind of a controversial thing. Uh, anyway, um, but to the extent that they are, that they are new, they're, they're very new. Um, now, they're kind of like autoencoders, but they're a little, they're structured a little bit differently. So now there are, there are definitely two distinct neural networks and, um, that are, um, in the generative adversarial network. There's what's called a generator and what's called a discriminator. And here's how they work. Um, the generator and discriminator are trained simultaneously and they're, they're kind of trained back, um, like in a single loop where you train one first and then the other and then go back and forth. And they are, um, their objectives are in mutual conflict with each other. So the generator's job is, is basically the same as the decoder in an autoencoder. It takes in, its job is to take in random numbers and poof, create an image from them. Um, and the way that, see the generator is the decoder basically, and, um, and then the discriminator, its job is to decide or to, to predict whether or not the image it's receiving is from the generator, or in other words, it's fake, or if it's from the data set, in other words, it's real, right? Um, and their, so their objectives are in mutual conflict. The generator is trying to fool the discriminator. The discriminator is trying to, um, you know, catch the generator, you could say. Another uh, analogy sometimes you'll hear is like the generator is in a, um, a counterfeiter and the discriminator is the, I don't know, like the counterfeit police or something like that. Um, so something like that, art appraiser, you hear art appraiser and, and, and um, I don't know, like artist, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm so, somehow today's not my day. Right. Uh, um, anyway, um, now they're really they're really awesome. They produce really compelling looking images. They have a lot of new applications. Um, they they have lots of problems as well, and this is going to be stuff that is a little bit beyond the scope of our class, but but is just kind of useful trivia. Um, at least early on, they were very hard to train. You know, people would train them, and they and the loss functions would blow up, and because they're very unstable, it's only really like a recent thing that neural networks became trainable. That's the thing. Now we take for granted that when you just like click train, ML five will give you uh, a perfect, you know, for, uh, a perfect um, neural network for the task that you trained like one hundred percent of the time. It used to be that like you couldn't rely on that to happen. Sometimes it would actually like the process would would give you junk, more or less. Yeah? Oh, I thought you had, okay. Um, another problem with them is that um, they, they don't, they don't um, allow for what's called inference, which means that um, you don't have a true model of probability. So like in an autoencoder, for example, you can take any image and then, and then it's, a, it's a sort of true probabil probabilistic model. It decides how likely any image is to exist. Um, and and um, you don't have that with a generative adversarial network because it doesn't actually evaluate that. It's, it's um, the way that it's, it doesn't evaluate anything actually because like it's this adversarial process. The generator and discriminator are just kind of like trained together in conflict with each other, but there's no, there's no um, like uh, objective that can be empirically, you know, like uh, ascertained, right? There's no, there's no way of evaluating how good it is, right? Um, like you can't say, like uh, once again, it's trained, 
the only way to evaluate it is that you just decide whether or not it look you like it like whether it looks good so there's no so this is kind of this is not good either um, mathematicians hate GANs because they're kind of this like com com computer programmer hack more or less which is kind of which is kind of like machine learning in a, a, um, in gen more generally but especially GANs um, they um, and also you can't encode images right so in other words like with a with a with an autoencoder you can take any image and then encode it into the latent space um, and then you know it the, the decoder does not perfectly reconstruct it but at least you have some approximation you know you can throw your face into the into the autoencoder if you want to but and again there's no way of doing that because this is um, there's no encoder right the this code comes from nowhere basically so um, there are um, ways around this. You can you can actually backprop to try to figure out a good you know there's there's hacks that let you encode images into the space and we'll maybe show those when we look at StyleGAN because there's some hacks associated with StyleGAN, um, but otherwise it's a weakness. Um, but what they do do is make really really uh, awesome pictures and not very blurry ones. And actually this is. You're looking at a paper from 2015, so a lot has changed, actually. A lot has gotten a lot better. Wow, it's already six. <laughs> so, okay, let's just, let's just prioritize. So I'm gonna finish the sort of GAN lecture, and then basically we'll wait to actually do anything practical with them until next week. Um, so let's just get through the slides, and then next week will be all practical. Um, so um, this was the first paper uh, that demonstrated um, GANs on images, or at, le or at least GANs on images with uh, GANs with convolutional layers on, to produce images. So this was from uh, Alec Radford and his collaborators, Sumith Chintala, Luke Metz. This is a landmark paper. Uh, when I saw this, I was like really blown away, and actually the whole machine learning community was blown away by this. This no one thinks is impressive anymore, <laughs> right? But at, at the um, at the time. Uh, it, no one had ever seen images that were so sort of like crisp and, and uh, not blurry and you know like uh, from a generative model. I thought this was impossible like back in the day. Um, back in the day being 2013 you know or whatever. Um, and but it turns out that you can uh, that, that you know they were actually pretty good and uh, they actually demonstrated uh, all of these things that we now see a lot in generative models and also in other areas of machine learning that you could do arithmetic on the features. So for example, let's say you find the latent code, the latent input vector, which when run through the generator produces images that appear to be smiling women. You know, here's your smiling woman vector. And then you find the vector that produces neutral woman right the um, non-smiling woman basically neutral woman um, and then you add neutral man well then you get smiling woman minus neutral woman plus neutral man equals smiling man right because the uh, woman minus woman cancels out zero and then you just add man and you get smiling man and you could do you could do all sorts of things you could you could like add glasses onto people's faces you could Whatever vector that you could find that denoted some feature transformation, like maybe aging or blonde-haired vector or whatever, you can you can like encode those features onto the images. Yeah. When you say vector, you're actually talking about the input vector. The uh, yeah, like this, this thing, right? But then that input vector generates like slightly different results over time. Uh, well, this will be like uh, I guess the way this was made is probably like slight. Like, like it'll generate the exact same image every time. Uh, a neural network is fixed. Right, but like, so like it's, your like smiling woman in this case. Yeah, it, it, it'll be some neighborhood or whatever. Okay. Like, um, I think you know something like a neighborhood of points. Yeah. Okay. And, and the point of encoding images into the latent space, space in GAN, uh, would the feature increase like the simulate like a bigger data set somehow? Wait, sorry, the, the doing what? Like why would why would we wanna encode? Uh, Real images. images into this space? Yeah. Oh, um, so I'll show you a model actually in a few slides where uh, would show this much better. But um, for example, like once if you let's say you want to do make changes to so here here we're doing arithmetic on features where we turn smiling woman into smiling man. So in other words, we found a gender vector. So um, so like if you 
want to be able to modify real images rather than fake ones, then uh, you'd need to be able to encode the image into the space. And one model actually does that. Um, it's not a generative adversarial network, but it's um, but it is a generative model called Glow. Um, and I have that in a few slides, which shows you the utility of that. So, like, I put blonde hair in myself, for example. Um, yeah, and 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 pretty much they're all trying to do that now. Man with glasses minus man plus woman equals woman with glasses. So this kind of stuff. Um, um, then they they showed fake bedrooms again like all of these um, are by today's standards actually not that impressive anymore but in 2015 like this was totally novel um, these were you know fake bedrooms and so I just thought that was so awesome like this is the the original the OG as I would say of um, a face interpolation models that you see now all the time and again, like if you've seen StyleGAN and all this, they look like realistic faces. Back then, we were like, "Wow, these are realistic," you know, <laughs> like how realistic is that? <laughs> so, um, so Alec Radford, um, who who's the prime uh, author on this paper, he also did what I would kind of consider the first like artwork um, with GANs, although although it didn't call itself that because, you know, why bother? Uh, but he basically made album covers. These were trained on, like, you know, albums, like musical albums. Um, 32 pixels by 32 pixels, I think. Um, I trained this on MNIST. I made a um, MNIST DC GAN. So this is kind of doing interpolations between the numbers. Um, so, um, so, yeah, it's kind of neat stuff like that. Um, okay, so this was a project that I did. I'm going to show it to you real quick because this was um, this is my first project with GANs, and I think it was the first like artwork with GANs. Now obscure fact, um, I found a data set of handwritten Chinese characters. This is called HITOR3C. It's a data set that was being collected for the purposes of optical character recognition. I know a lot of you can read it. I actually could for a while. Like at, while I was doing this project, I learned to recognize like the maybe. 20 most common characters in Chinese. Um, I've forgotten by now, though. I, I just don't know some of them. Uh, but anyway, like these are all handwritten. Handwritten. I had there's something like 200,000 of them. So um, actually, it would be great to retrain this. This would be a really nice like project to re-download this data set and retrain um, one of these GANs on them. Uh, do a better job than I did. Um, and the project is called The Book from the Sky. Maybe some of you know the work by Xu Bing, who's in New York, actually. Um, but anyway, like that's all online. Uh, but the point is that these characters, the ones on the right of these pairs, they're fake. So that you can see the reconstructions are pretty good. Um, and then um, you can do interpolations through the latent space, and so you get different versions of the same characters. Um, I've been trotting this project around for the last couple of years. You can do interpolations between characters. And so the way I always think of this is like, um, you know, like, okay, Chinese is like, um, Chinese writing is pictograms, right? So every, every character represents, you know, broadly speaking, a word. Not exactly, but, you know, roughly speaking, let's say. So, um, well, why do we have the pictograms that we do? You know, the however many it is, like 10,000 or something, something like that, 10,000. Um, you know, like maybe there's some concept between people and culture for which, for which no one ever bothered to make a character, you know? Um, and so this is my harebrained interpretation of this. This is kind of like, you know, making characters for concepts that don't have, wor that don't have words for them. Um, you know, because every word is just a point in this sort of conceptual space, this sort of mental fabric. I know I'm going off the rails a little bit, but you know. <laughs> um, but you know, that, that's kind of the idea. Anyway, um, more stuff. This preserves the radicals, all, all neat stuff. I learned a lot about Chinese, actually, in the process of making this work. I had some help from Francis Tseng, by the way, who maybe some of you know. I think he, he may or may not have taught a class here at some point. Um, but anyway, uh, there were a few other DC GAN projects around this time. These are anime, or sorry, manga characters. These are flowers, um, so you can find those online. Um, actually, your uh, cohort here at ITP, Sam Haynes, who 
um, is uh, he graduated, I guess, um, oh no, he's graduating this year, right? No, he already graduated, sorry, right. Um, Sam made this, um, so Sam, before he was at ITP, he took a workshop with me in uh, Serbia, and he made this project called Zero Likes. Um, and Zero Likes is a, the, a get, it was a uh, generative model trained on pictures that he scraped from Instagram that had zero likes. Ah. So it's the, and then he made a Twitter account that would just post these pictures, and it's just the saddest, you know, in Twitter account in the world, zero likes. Uh, and then also just to for funnies, he he added the um, like I am to text module to it, so that you know he would get these and then and then tweet whatever the model thinks it is. So this is man takes a picture of himself, and and do you not see it like? You know, it's kind of like I see a, I see a, you know, like kind of a selfie position, right? Then and then this is the man. Yeah. So um, these are kind of like it's. This is kind of the uh, Rorsch, uh, Rorschire, Rorschach, Rorschach, Rorschach diagram, right? Where where you're asked to you know transcribe, you know, some something like uh, in an image. These, these are my favorite though. Dog looks at a cat in the mirror, which is really, really weird, right? A dog looks at a cat in the mirror. It's like really, you know, post postmodern, I think. So here's the dog, I think, and there's and there's a cat. And then I also really like how um, it captures those cheesy Instagram filters also. See that border? Um, and Riddler, who's a, another friend of mine, she did this project with tulips, generating tulips. So these are just different projects that made use of GANs. Um, this project has been in a bunch of museums. Um, and GANs have just been exploding, basically, like over the last few years. Um, this is already outdated. Just in 2017, you can see how many GAN papers there were. Um, it, it was occupying a big chunk of the machine learning research. It's leveled off a little bit, I think, more recently. but. There's still a lot of uh, work going into GANs, different kinds of GANs that have different properties. Attention GAN, for example, is a GAN that's, that's conditioned on sentences. There's GANs that are conditioned on, let's say, audio or you know, image, uh, other images. There's these image-to-image -image GANs that we'll look at probably uh, in two weeks, I would say. So there's just a lot of different things you can do with them. Um, you know, this was just what, this was, I think uh, maybe a year after DC Gen, and they were already producing images that looked pretty realistic, although lo like weirdly discolored in some cases. But um, but um, yeah, like the state of the art had really really advanced. And then um, yeah, these are just like a few different random. These are just a few random selection of Gans that have different properties. So InfoGen tries to give a latent space that you could actually have a little bit more control over, where where it tried to kind of make each element in the latent vector correspond to some meaningful feature uh, because they're not necessarily like like if you want to change for example the rotation of something or the you know or the or the the um, like okay the smile vector let's say in the in the DC GAN it wasn't just that one of the numbers in the uh, latent space corresponded to smile like if you dialed it it would change the smile it, the smile vector would be actually like a vector in the entire space like you would have to change all of the numbers slightly you know to some degree um, and then InfoGAN was trying to make it so that there was a little bit more separation of the features along the elements um, then you have like all of these like just more exotic things like deep generator networks for example which are kind of combining they were uh, co this was these were actually really awesome like when they first came out they were pretty cutting edge and they were actually trying to combine uh, gener uh, like a, like D uh, GANs with uh, something like Deep Dream, where the objective was to actually maximize some class activation, like you know a candle, a banana, a convertible, or something like that. And so that was um, that was a really neat project, which which uh, a lot of us had some fun using. Around this time, like what I was doing is basically just scouring GitHub and just picking up open source projects and just running them, making stuff. Um, and this, this kind of got a lot of mileage. So here's a cheeseburger. Um, so on waiting room, ballroom, auditorium, arch, like all of these different things. Uh, these are already pretty aged by now. I think maybe two, two three years. Um, but 
but still pretty relevant. Um, imaginary places, gazebos, fields, farms, ticket booth, water parks. This is all kind of like um, when GANs were first sort of hitting their stride. Buttes, uh, imaginary boathouses. What I really like about this is that notice that like the these are boathouses and they're on the water and the GAN is actually producing what looks like uh, reflections, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see reflections of the houses. Um, sometimes the GAN sort of forgets and like reflects something that's like not actually above it, so it's, which is really freaky. Um, but sometimes it does a really good job. Discotheques, you know, so this is like what you all do on Friday night, I assume, here in New York. Um, these are all pe people are sort of artifacts because there's no people class and so um, this is the Trump vector. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I really like this ba basketball court. I really like the way that this came out because, like, it's like, is this, is this a head, or is it a basketball, like going up for a, a three? <laughs> um, one of the first really awesome attempts at making um, imaginary faces that was actually like very artistic was made by Mike Tyka, who is who of Deep Dream fame. Uh, and this was actually before style GAN, so this was this was actually like a high resolution. It wasn't what he did was actually like would produce the low resolution faces, and then he would upsample them through an upsampling uh, neural network. I think that's how it worked, and that produced you know these sort of imaginary people. I think he did a really good job with this project. Uh, but then that was blown away by 2017 when Nvidia came out with these progressively growing GANs. So again, like. Note the difference between 2015 and 2017, and that was actually late 2015. So this was like barely two years, like even less than two years from uh, from this. You know, okay. Like, sorry, wait. Let's look at <laughs> where is it? This. Okay, from this, 32 pixels, 32 pixels, 32 by 32 pixels to less than two years later, um, <coughs> this. And even this has now been outdone by style GAN and big GAN and other GANs that, that make faces that are even more realistic than this. Because this is okay, it's kind of weird sometimes. You know, the hair goes away. Some of these faces are super realistic, some of them aren't as realistic. Um, but StyleGAN actually makes things that are almost indistinguishable. In fact, I think I have a slide on that. Uh, one second. That's... Oh, I have it somewhere later. I will see. The, uh, I'll show you that. Yeah. I did, as a joke, I tried to uh, find images in the progressively grown GANs video that looked like celebrities. So I would use the face, uh, face identification library and then I put in a bunch, I did like an analyzed a bunch of celebrity faces and I tried to find like celebrity lookalikes that were produced by progressively grown GANs. So I think the Renee Zellweger is actually pretty good. Um, I don't know about the Chris Rock one, kind of weird, but, but, but close. Selma Hayek, Ben Stein, um, Kate Moss, Robert De Niro, Matt Damon, Rick Santorum. And this is my favorite. This actually, <laughs> this actually, uh, like, got Mother Teresa and Rodney Dangerfield. I thought that was just really wicked. Yeah, yeah, they do, right? Oh, six fifteen already. Okay, so okay, let's. Um, we'll stop there. I I have like a, not too many. No, I have a fair number of slides left. So, <laughs> so, but not that many. Like, it's really just mostly eye candy. So. Uh, the meme vector is uh, like just uh, basically there was a generative model released by NVIDIA of cats. And so the cat, it had been trained on, by images of cats on the internet. And so basically you can, if you find enough images that accidentally produce, you know, those weird block letters, mm -hmm. then, um, then you can basically have it, you know, cruise around that space. So this is kind of the, the cat meme vector. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, we'll, we'll continue this next week, and then we'll get into some tools. We'll talk about style GAN, DC GAN, all that. Uh, and I'll be much more sort of alert. Um, yeah. yeah.
Excellent presentations today, everybody. Thanks a lot. That was really, really awesome. And uh, those of you coming in for office hours tomorrow, I'll see you. And uh, everyone else, like, I'll see you next week. Yes. Basically, or style gun. Yeah. Does it in any way inform the data?